About this time there arose in my heart the desire to lead an expedition against the infidels, and to become a Ghazi. For it had reached my ears that the slayer of infidels is a Ghazi, and if he is slain he becomes a martyr. It was on this account that I formed this resolution, but I was undetermined in my mind whether I should direct my expedition against the infidels of China or against the infidels and polytheists of India. In this matter I sought an omen from the Quran, and the verse I opened upon was this, O Prophet, make war upon infidels and unbelievers, and treat them with severity. My great officers told me that the inhabitants of Hindustan were infidels and unbelievers. In obedience to the order of Almighty Allah, I determined on an expedition against them. Later, he describes the sack of Delhi in his own words. In a short space of time, all the people in the fort were put to the sword, and in the course of one hour the heads of ten thousand infidels were cut off. The sword of Islam was washed in the blood of the infidels, and all the goods and effects, the treasure and the grain, which for many a long year had been stored in the fort, became the spoil of my soldiers. They set fire to the houses and reduced them to ashes, and they razed the buildings and the fort to the ground. All these infidel Hindus were slain, their women and children, and their property and goods became the spoil of the victors. I proclaimed throughout the camp that every man who had infidel prisoners should put them to death and whoever neglected to do so should himself be executed and his property given to the informer. When this order became known to the Ghazis of Islam, they drew their swords and put their prisoners to death. One hundred thousand infidels, impious idolaters, were on that day slain. On the great day of battle, these one hundred thousand prisoners could not be left with the baggage, and it would be entirely opposed to the rules of war to set these idolaters and enemies of Islam at liberty. No other course remained but that of making them all food for the sword. स्वामी जी आप अंधविश्वास के खिलाफ हो हो ना लेकिन मूर्ति पूजा में आप बुराई नहीं समझो अब इन मात्र समाधान किस तरह करोगा मैं मूर्ति पूजा में विश्वास को नहीं करूं दूसरा लोगों की तरह लकड़ी मिट्टी धातुरी पूजा मैं को नहीं कर सकूं इस बारे में आप क्या कहोगे ये किसका चित्र है महाराज का दीवान जी कृपया इस चित्र को उतारिए दीवान जी इस पर थूकिए मैं कह रहा हूं थूकिए थूकिए इस चित्र पर स्वामी जी ये आपने कहीं करवा रहा वास्ते कह रहा हूं यह महाराज रो चित्र है मैं ये किस तरह कर सकूं लेकिन ये तो सिर्फ कागज का एक टुकड़ा है ना तो इसमें महाराज की हड्डियां हैं ना मांस ना रक्त ना तो ये महाराज की तरह बोलता है और ना ही उनकी तरह व्यवहार करता है फिर भी आप इस पर थूकने से इनकार कर रहे हैं क्योंकि इस चित्र में आप अपने महाराज के रूप की छाया देख रहे हैं वास्तव में आप इस पर थूकने से अपने महाराज अपने स्वामी का अपमान समझ रहे हैं देखिए महाराज एक अर्थ में आप इस तस्वीर में हैं और दूसरे अर्थ में आप नहीं हैं आपके स्वामी भक्त कर्मचारी इस तस्वीर को उतना ही सम्मान देते हैं जितना वो आपके व्यक्ति को देते हैं यही बात उन भक्तों पर लागू होती है जो पत्थर या धातु की देवी देवताओं की मूर्तियों की पूजा करते हैं प्रतिमा उनके मन में उनके इष्ट को लाकर खड़ा कर देती है और इस बात में मदद करती है कि वो अपने प्रभु में मन रमा सके वास्तव में वो पत्थर या धातु की मूर्ति की पूजा नहीं करते महाराज सभी लोग एक ही ईश्वर की पूजा करते हैं उस ईश्वर की जो परम आत्मा है शुद्ध ज्ञान की चरम सीमा और ईश्वर भी लोगों को उनके ज्ञान और उनकी समझ के अनुसार दर्शन दिया करते हैं स्वामी जी आपने मेरी आंखें खोल दी दीवान जी तस्वीर को उसकी जगह पर टांग दी
Concept of Image Worship God is eternal, without any form, omnipresent. To think of Him as possessing any form is blasphemy. But the secret of image worship is that you are trying to develop your vision of divinity in one thing. All of you have been taught to believe in an omnipresent God. Try to think of it. How few of you can have any idea of what omnipresence means? If you struggle hard, you will get something like the idea of ocean, or of the sky, or of a vast stretch of green earth, or of a desert. All these are material images, and so long as you cannot conceive of the abstract as abstract, of the ideal as the ideal, you will have to resort to these forms, these material images. It does not make much difference whether these images are inside or outside the mind. We are all born idolaters, and idolatry is good, because it is in the nature of man. Who can get beyond it? Only the perfect man, the God-man. The rest are all idolaters. So long as we see the universe before us, with its forms and shapes, we are all idolaters. This is a gigantic symbol we are worshipping. He who says that he is the body, is a born idolater. We are spirit, spirit that has no form or shape, spirit that is infinite, and not matter. Therefore anyone who cannot grasp the abstract, who cannot think of himself as he is, except in and through matter, as the body, is an idolater. And yet how people fight among themselves, calling one another idolaters. In other words, each says, his idol is right, and the others are wrong. Two sorts of persons never require any image, the human animal who never thinks of any religion, and the perfected being who has passed through these stages. Between these two points all of us require some sort of ideal, outside and inside. Christians think that when God came in the form of a dove it was all right, but if he comes in the form of a fish, as the Hindus say, it is very wrong and superstitious. The Jews think if an idol be made in the form of a chest with two angels sitting on it, and a book on it, it is all right, but if it is in the form of a man or a woman, it is awful. The Mohammedans think that when they pray, if they try to form a mental image of the temple with the Kaaba, the black stone in it, and turn towards the west, it is all right, but if you form the image in the shape of a church it is idolatry. This is the defect of image worship. We may worship anything be seeing God in it, if we can forget the idol and see God there. We must not project any image upon God. But we may fill any image with that life which is God. Only forget the image, and you are right enough for out of him comes everything. He is everything. We may worship a picture as God, but not God as the picture. God in the picture is right, but the picture as God is wrong. God in the image is perfectly right. There is no danger there. This is the real worship of God. Superstition is a great enemy of man, but bigotry is worse. Why does a Christian go to church? Why is the cross holy? Why is the face turned toward the sky in prayer? Why are there so many images in the Catholic Church? Why are there so many images in the minds of Protestants when they pray? My brethren, we can no more think about anything without a mental image than we can live without breathing. By the law of association the material image calls up the mental idea and vice versa. This is why the Hindu uses an external symbol when he worships. He will tell you, it helps to keep his mind fixed on the being to whom he prays. He knows as well as you do that the image is not God, is not omnipresent. After all how much does omnipresence mean to almost the whole world? It stands merely as a word, a symbol. Has God superficial area? If not, when we repeat the word omnipresent, we think of the extended sky or of space, that is all. Unity and variety is the plan of nature, and the Hindu has recognized it. Every other religion lays down certain fixed dogmas, and tries to force society to adopt them. 
It places before society only one coat which must fit Jack and John and Henry, all alike. If it does not fit John or Henry, he must go without a coat to cover his body. The Hindus have discovered that the Absolute can only be realized, or thought of, or stated, through the relative, and the images, crosses and crescents are simply so many symbols so many pegs to hang the spiritual ideas on. It is not that this help is necessary for everyone, but those that do not need it have no right to say that it is wrong. Nor is it compulsory in Hinduism. It has been a trite saying, that idolatry is wrong, and every man swallows it at the present time without questioning. I once thought so, and to pay the penalty of that I had to learn my lesson sitting at the feet of a man who realized everything through idols. I allude to Ramakrishna for Ramhamsa. Take a thousand idols more if you can produce Ramakrishna for Ramhamsas through idol worship, and may God speed you. Idolatry in India does not mean anything horrible. It is not the mother of harlots. On the other hand it is the attempt of undeveloped minds to grasp high spiritual truths. Man is to become divine by realizing the divine. Idols, or temples or churches or books are only the supports, the helps, of his spiritual childhood. But on and on he must progress. Therefore, we should get rid of these childish notions. We should get beyond the prattle of men who think that religion is merely a mass of frothy words, that it is only a system of doctrines. To whom religion is only a little intellectual assent or dissent. To whom religion is believing in certain words which their own priests tell them. To whom religion is something which their forefathers believed. To whom religion is a certain form of ideas and superstitions to which they cling, because they are their national superstitions. We should get beyond all these, and look at humanity as one vast organism, slowly coming towards light, a wonderful plant, slowly unfolding itself to that wonderful truth which is called God, and the first gyrations, the first motions, towards this are always through matter and ritual. 